First, I want to thank you for taking the time to hang out today. Um, I always appreciate when people are interested in what I have to say. Uh, for me, a high percentage of the time, a lot of my perspectives are not the most popular perspectives. But my goal is not to win a popularity contest, but to encourage people to think. You know, I don't need agreement. I don't need disagreement because it doesn't matter to me. The only thing that matters is we have opportunity to think about some things and potentially it'll make sense to us or not. That's all that matters. So um, I'm originally from Hartford, Connecticut, born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, one of the things I like to say always is that I love you. I love black people. I love African people. I love indigenous universal beings, or what I call divine universal humans becoming, that we are. And I will never give up on our people. Some people get frustrated and tired, and there can never be a word tired for me when it comes to my desire to share information and help people and encourage people to think and, and use our own mind and consciousness. Now, I am one who has a great deal of respect for our ancestors. I have a great deal of respect for our elders. And I honor our an ancestors and our elders as well. But I also feel like it's our responsibility to take what they left and stand on their shoulders and not walk in their footsteps. As long as we continue walking in their footsteps and we're demonstrating we didn't learn anything from what they left. And today we have a lot of us walking in their footsteps and training next generations to walk in their footsteps and do the same thing 60 years later that they did 60 years ago for the same reason 60 years later that they did 60 years ago, which demonstrates that what they did 60 years ago didn't work. So, and we can't be fragile and sensitive when it comes to challenging the things that our ancestors did. We have to question what they did. Because as we know in our own personal lives, everything we did in the past, when we think back on it, we know we could have done other things that would have been a better approach. That's just human life. So yes, our ancestors did some things. But we have the privilege of looking back and understanding what they could have done better. And so I respect the ancestors, I respect the elders, but I also respectfully challenge everything that everybody does, including the ancestors and the elders, because it's my desire to learn and grow and evolve and not keep walking in their footsteps, doing the same things over and over again. Um, and then the other thing that I want to say that is extremely important is that in addition to honoring the ancestors and the elders, I honor our women. We have what is called a Father's Day celebration tomorrow. But without our women, there'd be no fathers. Without our women, there'd be no ancestors. Without our women, there'd be no elders. So I would like to share with you a piece that I wrote in honor of our women. And it's called, For You There Are No Words. I see you, this beautiful black female work of art. And with all my heart, I want to free you from all the mental anguish and pain of watching we be these little boys as we play with our little toys. Guns, cars, clothes, money, jewelry, and the rest of our little boy joys. You watch and you wait while it's our own people we continue to destroy and hate. 
But in order to free you, I must see you with more than just my eyes, but with my mind. And I must be kind with more than just my words, but with my actions. And I must become that African man with more than just perseverance and inner searching, but the help of the creator, the same one that made her. I know I can. I must earn your trust because your history has determined that you have earned the right to be free. And it is my responsibility to evolve to manhood and see that you live with peace harmony and prosperity. I feel you more than I ever thought I could because there was a time I never thought I would. It is not a physical thing but a spiritual feeling that comes with listening to my consciousness and the stress becomes less and less and because this is just a quest. I repeat, because this is just a quest to quell the unruly seed that fuels the unruly need for greed, I cannot rest until I relieve myself from this mess. And my mental fights with Rome become mental rights, and before long, my mental lights come on, and I finally begin to see it is only you, this beautiful black queen, who can truly make me happy. I smell you and think of all that is good as the aroma stopped me right where I stood, and I began to wish that I could and should be the best man that I can at the wedding, at the park, when it's dark in the light, as long as I'm in anyone's sight, I just smell you and to your delight, I want to do all that is right. All day and all night and there will be no fights because you'll have the green light and I will follow and wish that you'll still call me after last night. I hope it's today because I'll be crazy by tomorrow because when I smell you, I feel so good. I worship you because I know without you there would be no we. From before slavery to after BET, there would be no blues, bojangles, or tap shoes, no jazz or hip hop, no rap, Missy, P. Diddy, or Biggie, no rock and roll, James Brown, reggae, Tupac, Soka, or Soul, no R&B, MTV, or Muhammad Ali, no soccer, tennis, or basketball shorts, because there would be no sports, no Malcolm Martin and Marcus, because there would be no history or ancestors for us, no Rosa, Harriet, or Fanny, black man, what is it going to take? for us to see that this beautiful black woman in our midst is responsible for everything that is, has been, and will ever be, because here on earth, the true representation of the creator, it is she. When I hold you, there's a feeling of numbness followed by warmth, passion, and then dumbness. Because I know I have become less than my ancestor's definition of a true African man. One who makes a stand and takes control of himself. Embraces Africa and puts that European, his story, on the shelf. Builds a family on the foundation of morals, values, and principles that are never compromised. Pays no attention to those who ridicule and criticize. Forever strives to become more conscious and wise. Instructs young kings and queens that with knowledge of self, precious goals and dreams can be realized. He defines his own wants, needs, and desires. He creates his own businesses and is his family, including those who look like and support him he hires. Yes, a true African man passes the test, the knowledge, and all his best down to the next generation so that once he retires, the family's quality of life continues to rise higher and higher and higher and so on and so on and so on. And so as I attempt to put into practice what has been said, I repeat this knowledge over and over again in my head so that when again I hold you, I feel complete. I will protect you until the death. Until long after I take my final breath. And yes, this implies until there no more compromises, blue skies, sunrises, or surprises. No birds, bees, or trees. Until the lies, the lust, the limelight, and the lawsuit loot is gone. Until there no more sad songs and loving you is right and not wrong. Until all oceans and seas become sand and dry land and just remnants of what was once man. Until the idea of hot and cold become ancient stories only told by those more than 10,000 years old. Until it takes more than putting a hole in my tongue, private parts of face to be bold. Until the final race, the final chase, and the last lawyer's last case. Until all ghettos become boardwalk and park place. And all wicked and evil people disappear without a trace. Until the last supper, revelation, and the resurrection. I, from now until will be your protection and finally I just want to get to hold you get to show you how much I owe you the right to relax when I come your way 
and not turn to your girlfriends and say, here comes another sorry brother ready to wreck my day. I want you to feel like flowers greeting the sun or when the mortgage payments are done, like the smell of fresh hot butter popcorn or when that first child is born. I, I want you to toot my horn to see me as a breath of fresh air make all your friends stop and stay in our direction because our connection is the right one. Our relationship is a tight one. I am yours and yes, you are my one and only and even when I am not there, you are never lonely. Even when I am not there, you are never lonely because your thoughts of me take you to ecstasy until again I am there for you to see. Please with my presence to the extent that I too am pleased to be present and mutual feelings are so intense it makes no sense to be this confident because I just want you, I just want to be what you want me to be. And if it makes us both happy and you finally trust me and I am worthy, I don't know, we'll see, but maybe, just maybe, one day, you'll marry me. Thank you very much. That's for you to honor words, and that's a tribute to our women. Now, um, I'm going to say some real basic things, uh, because one of the things I talk about in the full, in the full package is developing a successful life philosophy. A developing a successful, successful life philosophy means having some type of foundation of thought that assists us with moving on in life. And we can kind of refer back to it and continue to adjust it as long as, as we continue learning and growing. Because like uh, you said, the education never stops, man. Life is a series of challenges. You cannot live without challenges. It's impossible. Doesn't matter how hard you work, how much you pray, it's going to be some challenges. And our life is determined by the quality of the decisions we make during those challenges. And for us, to move in this reality, especially the reality that we see out here now, where conflict and confrontation is the norm. It's very important for us to know that there is nothing more important on this planet and in this life existence than how we feel about ourselves. What we think about ourselves and how we feel about ourselves determine everything. It determines everything. It determines how we receive education. It determines how we receive information. It determines how we live. It determines what our goals are, what our aspirations are. Everything we do is basically determined by how we feel about ourselves and what we think about ourselves. And the reason why that's important is because we live in a reality where there's always somebody trying to have an influence on how we feel about ourselves. There's always somebody trying to determine how we feel about ourselves. And so every day when we walk out of the house, if we haven't reestablished how we feel about ourselves, we kind of leave ourselves open to allowing others to determine how we feel about ourselves from one minute to the next. And this is very basic, but this is like, this is the brick foundation that everything we do stands on. And we can never underestimate that. So, how we feel about ourselves is very important. Um, another very important piece and let me say this early, is we have to become better at allowing each other to share where we are, are period. If 
I'm operating based on a certain philosophy and understanding. If it makes sense, that's fine. If it doesn't, that's fine. Black people in America in particular are the last people on earth who needs to be intolerable of different perspectives because we come from so many different realities. When we, look, we look the same when we're in the room, but some of us gonna hit that mat five times a day. Some of us wanna start everything we do with a prayer. Some of us need to have tea for 90 minutes before we get started. And all of these things come from the colonial background we come from. So when we try to have a meeting, we're coming from all of these different, what I call colonial places. And these colonial places are simply how white people raised us, for lack of a better way to describe it, to put it bluntly. And so in order for us to understand or demonstrate we understand we coming from these different places, we have to be able to accept each other as we are without challenging each other all the time on every little thing. You know, uh, I might have some of my island brothers and sisters who are sitting in the meeting, and because they're brought up under a British regime, they're used to socializing for an hour before the meeting starts. That's just how, that's part of their culture. They want to talk and have some tea and eat, you know, and, and then if you come from a different place, you're like, listen, we said the meeting was going from 7 to 8.30. I got 90 minutes. I got things to do. And they're saying, it's okay. So what I'm saying is, if we truly want to get something done with each other, we have to be able to tolerate the differences and accept them without going at each other the way we do. And we have to communicate with each other in a way we want to be communicated to. So I stand here, I never look for agreement or disagreement like I said earlier. I share it, you can take it or leave it. There's a gentleman who told me a long time ago, well, no, I wasn't, it's been not that long ago. Say in the 1990s, in the community I was in, they were trying to usher me into this community leadership kind of thing. And he said, listen, and they gave me the Hartford, Connecticut Citizen of the Year and all of this stuff, and they were, I was being groomed into this community leadership thing. And a, a, a gentleman pulled me to the side. He said, let me tell you two things, a couple of things. He said, if you're going to get out here with this mission to assist our people, don't do it with the goal of trying to get us to do anything. The last thing on the planet you want to do is be out here with this goal of trying to get people to do something. Because everybody's coming from their place, and they locked in from seven years old. Once that, that foundation you give a person from birth to seven, that's what they're going to live and die with and defend at least until they get to college and start getting exposed to other things and start thinking about stuff and reevaluating and all of that. But from seven to college, it's a wrap. They're people locked in. And then from 30 on, it's a wrap. Now that people started locking into their philosophies and thought process, you don't have a chance if you start moving with the goal of trying to get people to do things. So he said, the best thing you can do is share what you think is best, what makes sense to you, and those who are ready for it will receive it, and those who are not won't, but it becomes a, a dot in their consciousness. And then as they receive other information, all of a sudden it starts connecting to those dots, and then they refer back to it and bring it together. And now they, they are wherever they need to be at that time. So that's where I work from, um, sharing information. I'm not trying to lead anybody in there. I'm not trying to save the world. I'm not trying to save black people. I'm not trying to save anybody. I am trying to share information so that we can get ourselves involved in some thinking and help ourselves. 
because everything starts on the individual level. You can't have unity without individuals who are interested in uniting. <laughs> Just because a speaker can bring together two million people in a venue doesn't mean that's unity. That means two million people were interested in hearing what that speaker had to say. But they're still leaving with two million different mindsets and consciousnesses and whatever the effect that leader may have had on them, but that's not unity. And we've been taught that we have to have somebody standing in front of us leading us. And that, based on my own limited understanding of things, is a misnomer because I give an example of what, 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 what unity is really about. Every now and then I venture into the world of poetry, right? I come to York, Pennsylvania, and I ask somebody, do they have a poetry venue? And somebody says, well, yeah, on Tuesdays they do this, and on Sundays they do this. And I get to the poetry venue on Tuesday night, and it's 150 people in that poetry venue. There was no leader poet that got 150 people in that room. There was no leader poet that got 10 people in that room. There is no leader speaker that got us here. What got us here are individuals who are functioning of a certain mindset who found ourselves in the same place. And then in that place, coming from that same place, we have the opportunity to unite and then bring something forth. That's, that's what unity and, and, and working together, that's how it's really about. But it starts with individuals and individual consciousness. So we have to take full responsibility for ourselves and, and really move with the understanding that we desire to um, work with each other and bring about change. And the, the last thing that we ever want to do if we are interested in working together is come at each other in a confrontational way because that brings up defenses. And I'm a person who focuses on harmonious and productive communication because I believe that's where it all starts. If we don't have that, there's nothing happening, no matter what you think you know. And I'll say this, there's this quote that I, I, I say and the quote, I call it, be humble. And it says this, in comparison to all there is to know about the human body, about the planet Earth, about the universe, the solar system, the galaxy and the universe and potential universes, in comparison to all there is to know, what we know, or what we think we know, is but a speck of dust, dust from a grain of sand in a puzzle piece made up of an infinite number of grains of sand. In a puzzle made up of an infinite number of puzzle pieces. In a universe made up of an infinite number of puzzles. In a potentially infinite number of universes. Now let's come back to what we think we know. So we all need to just calm down. We read a book, we get some knowledge, we get some understanding about some things. And because of our swag, everything we do, sports, entertainment, everything, and education, we have a certain kind of swag. But in the world of education, our swag works against us because we get some information and then we want to just start slapping faces with it you know, demonstrating, helping you understand what you don't know. But what keeps me humble is that speck of dust from that grain of sand. We are all operating on an extremely limited understanding of life. And that's just real. So we have to work with each other a lot better. For me, again, based on my own limited understanding, 
We have to get rid of blaming the weather, the economy, the president, the racial climate, the neighbor, the barking dog. We have to get rid of blaming stuff for our condition. We have the ability to assess the reality we're in, develop an understanding of that reality, decide what we want from that reality, and then figure out how to make that reality serve us. Doesn't matter who thinks they're in charge. None of this stuff matters but our consciousness and how we approach it. Now, according to me, based on my own limited understanding, you'll, say that, you'll hear me say that often because that is my way of helping people understand that I don't think I have it all figured out. I'm just sharing it based on my own limited understanding. We are a universal people. When I say universal people, that doesn't mean we are the world and don't worry, be happy, and we just love everybody. When I say we are a universal people, what I mean is we come from a historical foundation rooted in universal law, universal principles, and universal understandings. Respectfully, in what you were saying, I personally believe the only law is universal law. Everything else is some rules. Laws don't change. Rules do. And rules change depending on who's in charge and what they want. You understand what I'm saying? Now, when we move based on universal laws, a brother said something earlier. He didn't say it in the way I say it, but he said the same thing. Somebody said, I'm, I can't remember who said it, but I'll say it like this. He who is most comfortable is the least likely to change. That's a universal law. Universal laws are just the absolute truth. Can't argue with it. He who is most comfortable is the least likely to change. Now that works in a lot of different ways. That means if you're trying to get somebody to do something and they're comfortable, you got a lot of work to do. The other side of that universal law is he who is doing the most complaining has to do the most changing. Just those two laws. Let me introduce another one. As I continue to work on and improve myself, every environment I walk in is improved simply because of my presence. On the other side of that, the more foul a person I am, no matter how pristine the environment, environment when I enter that environment, I diminish the quality of that environment. This is universal law. So what I'm saying is, if we understood that we are universal people, universal laws eliminate so much mess and muck and gray areas. Universal laws bring clarity. So just imagine if we all operated based on the knowledge of this one universal law that said, as I improve me, everything is better. That's just the truth. And then everybody focused on improving themselves as opposed to trying to force other people to adjust to our comfort so we can feel better. So I say we are a universal people. That's where we come from. There are indigenous people all over the world, including our ancestors in, on what is now called Africa, that continent who left information that constantly pointed to that fact. We are a universal people. And so there are these three basic 
universal principles that I always share that, again, transcend so much. You can have, I challenge any book with any rules for life, any so-called laws, and these three basic principles will encompass all of that because they're universal. They apply in every area of life. First principle is understand life. Understand life means first understanding ourselves and then understanding life, nature, how things work around us. We can learn so much from nature. Understanding life and what it means and how it works. As we understand ourselves, we ready ourselves to navigate different situations and circumstances. I hear people all the time say, well, you know how I am. I, I, I'm this kind of person. And then I watch them not know how they are. <laughs> because if you really knew how you were, then in certain situations, you would also know how to behave. Right or wrong? So the better we know ourselves, the better we understand how to move in this reality that we're in. Simple stuff. I don't like to be cold. And being cold might have a certain effect on how I feel. There's nothing wrong with that reality. But if I don't like to be cold and I go get a coat that's on sale and it don't keep me warm and now I'm going to work cold and the school cold and the teach cold and now I'm, 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 I'm bringing this energy of dislike into the places I'm going into, that doesn't make sense, right? So if I don't like cold, then it's my responsibility to get the biggest, warmest coat I can get so that I can be in the right energy to be in the person I want to be and do the things I want to do while given the right kind of energy. Does that make sense? These things are real simple, but it's serious as it relates to how life works. So the first principle is understanding life. It starts with understanding ourselves. The second principle is preserving life. Preserving life. Which starts with ourselves. There's no temple. I don't care how fancy the book is. I don't care how fancy the Buddha, the deity is. I don't care how fancy the temple or how old it is. I don't care how much gold is paved with. There's no temple on this planet more important than this one, our own, our own. Anybody that's out here worshiping any temples and ain't taking care of themselves, how, you can't respect that temple if you don't have no respect for this one. So the second principle is preserving life. So we do the things to, first of all, do everything we can to preserve this temple. And it's a challenge because that's how life is. It's a challenge. There's never not going to be a challenge with us working on preserving this temple. Never. Just like it's never not going to be a challenge in living in life. So preserve this temple. One of the key things when we work on preserving this temple, the better we understand life, understand ourselves, do the things that we can to preserve this temple and then be in the spirit and movement of preserving life. If we're in the spirit and energy of preserving life, we can't be in the spirit and energy of destroying life, right, at the same time. Those two things can't operate in the same space. So preserving life. The other thing about understanding our lives and preserving our lives is we can have compassion when we see people going through what we know we've been through. We can begin to now recognize and feel the energy people are in when they're in certain places and positions. 
we set ourselves up to have more compassion as opposed to be in conflict. So understand life, preserve life. And then the final principle is improve the quality of life for the whole. When we're working and we're doing things to contribute to improving the quality of life for the whole, it benefits us all. Now, if we were all working to contribute to improving the quality of life for the whole, everybody would benefit. So, again, these ba three basic universal principles, understanding life, preserving life, improving the quality of life for the whole. Can you think of any rules or any laws to living in life that's not included in that? This is how powerful universal understandings are. And as a universal people, there's a universal approach to life as well. There's a universal approach to life as well. And like I said, uh, it don't matter if it's raining or snowing. It, it, it don't matter what the economy is. It doesn't matter who thinks they're in charge. It doesn't matter who the president is or what he's doing. It really doesn't when we bring ourselves into this universal plane. Because there are a lot of dimensions in this existence. There are a lot of dimensions in this existence. And we choose the dimension we're going to exist in based on our own consciousness. And of course, there are dimensions in this existence we aren't aware of. And the way life works is like math. If you don't understand how to add and subtract, you're not going to get to multiplication and division. Life is set up in the same way. In order for us to get to these next dimensions and understandings, we have to have a full understanding of the one we're in. And we can't get the next levels of understanding. But the interesting thing is, and this is my own personal experience, the interesting thing is, is like when we're next, when we're ready for these next levels, like life just kind of open the door conscious door and you'd be like oh and, and it, certain thoughts and things that hit you and it'll open the door to a whole new set of information and then you're like overwhelmed and you know and then there's a, a this thing you go through where this new information is so much but now you want to let everybody know hey Hey, it's the next level here. And, and you just so, and nobody, ain't nobody trying to hear that because they ain't ready. And so the interesting thing is for each new door you open, there are fewer and fewer people in the room. That's just how it is. So that, that's how this thing works. So there's these three basic universal approaches to life. You can use them in the forest. You can use them in Europe. You can use them in America. You can use them on your job. You can even use them in the house. This universal approach to life says, understand the reality we're in. Understand the reality we're in. We have to learn this reality and how it works. The more we know about this reality, the easier it is for us to navigate it. Understand the reality we're in to the best of our ability. figure out what we want from that reality. A lot of us are just bouncing through here not knowing what we want. And then the third piece is once we understand the reality, we figured out what we want, now the goal is to make this reality serve our best interests. Period. You can take that universal approach to life anywhere. And it's going to work because it's real and it's universal. And so when I talk about we are universal people, those are the things I'm referencing. That's what I'm saying. We are universal people. A lot of us aren't aware of that, but we are. One of the things my, my brother over here, me and Willie, battle with. Matter of fact, I would say the reason why I'm putting this on the table because I battle with my people uh, I, I would say about 95% of the time, people totally come at me hard for this, my people. And that is when I say we are universal people, 
And if we have any interest in re-embracing our true foundation, we have to get out of white people's race-based paradigm. You can't move and operate based on race and be moved from a universal foundation. Those two things can't exist at the same time. Now, if we really have all this respect for the ancestors and the elders and all this respect for our history and all of that, many of us ignore the fact that we come from a universal foundation. We never were, we weren't people who thought in terms of race. Now, when we first saw white people, we might have been frightened and we might have ran from them because they was a little different than anything we've ever seen. But we didn't say, well, based on how they look, we have to ap operate this way. Somewhere along the line, we said, okay, the same way we did in the forest. Everything we learned about the forest, we had to learn about it. You dig what I'm saying? We didn't know what we were dealing with until we found out. Same thing with them. But what I'm saying is this. Our movements can't be based on reacting to them and what they are or what they aren't doing. Our movements have to simply be in our own best interest because it's just best for us. We can't live our lives reacting to these people and how they behave. They have to be just another entity in the forest. Okay, we understand how that moves and we have to move. It is our responsibility to move based on our understanding on how this moves. If we go in the forest with our toddler, our baby, and let it play with a baby tiger, and the mother comes and snatches the baby up and then it's a done deal, we can't be mad at it. It's our responsibility to understand how that works. You see a baby, any kind of animal, you're supposed to move far away because the mother ain't far away. No different than the mother, you the mother of your child. You far away from that child. That little dog. So this is, this is life. But as long as we got our foot in this race-based thinking, we can't truly embrace who we are. It's not possible. So the magic question I always get hit with, well, would you date a white girl? You sound like you're trying to come up with reasons to date a white girl. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they tell me people be thinking that all the time when we caught up in this race based stuff and I tell our people I would never not date a white girl just cause she white cause I can't I can't be where what's best for me and stay in that form of thinking not only that It is the most incredible waste of energy in all of us based on older, older people, based on our experience and understanding. All of us know when we have an emotional connection with somebody, ain't nobody going to tell us not to date that person. And that right there could start at 14, 15. If it's two 14-year-olds and they done for whatever they reason got an emotional connection, ain't nothing you can do with it. Now, you can move, <laughs> but it ain't going to change their desire to be with each other. And that doesn't change for the rest of your life. When you connect with somebody you want to be with, no matter who they are, it's nothing anybody chastising you going to do to change that. So when we start getting ourselves involved in lanes that we have zero control over, we are wasting so much energy and time. So I always say, I have a preference for African women, period. But I would never say I wouldn't date another race just because they the other race. No, I'm not being involved in that foolishness. Because if it goes down, it goes down. Because I'm interested in reconnecting truly into this universal place. And that's why I said earlier, we are divine, universal humans becoming meaning divine, our divinity is our connection with each other. We are not divine now because we aren't aware of our connection. 
not just to each other, but to all life forms. We don't understand, especially on a human level, how we hurt each other affects everything and everybody. Because it's on such a large scale as the energy is concerned, it's a ripple in the water, but it's a ripple in the water. So the damage we do to each other affects everybody and everything. This is why I said improve the quality of life for the whole. Everybody who ever said, I found my life calling and this is what I want to do for life in that moment. If you think about it, it always has something with improving the quality of life for the whole in one way or another. We kind of go back to that. It's innate, even though we don't even understand what it is we're saying and doing. That's what it boils down to. So with those quick notes, I I wanted to say one more thing. uh, Well, just a couple more things about our mindset. Everything we see that's not naked human beings in the forest started in the consciousness of man and woman. It was made manifest into reality. Everything we see, everything we see started in the consciousness of somebody and was made manifest into reality. Clothes, the shoes, the the, the floors, the walls, the ceilings, the baskets, there's nothing on this planet outside of naked human beings and nature that wasn't started from the mindset. So we have to always stay in touch with our imagination. We have to allow our young people to daydream. It's okay. We have to let them be imaginative. We can't shut down their imagination with, with balance. You know, there's balance with dreaming and reality, and that's cool. But it's imagination that brings forth things that improve the quality of life for the whole. That's where it comes from. So we have to, imagination is the source of all things produced. So we have to um, make sure imagination is important. And then the other thing is, we have to make sure, I, I'll tell you this story. I was doing a talk at home. This was around tr- when Trayvon Martin got um, hurt, killed. And a woman came, it was a white woman, she was what they call a liberal, and she was working with the black people and very concerned about black issues. And she, she, she came early and she said, Alfonso, are you going to the uh, march for Trayvon Martin? And I said, no, I don't march. I would never waste one ounce, one second, one moment of my life marching or poor protesting or boycotting. I, I, don't, I don't do that. And my, she was offended. And of course, when I say that to my people, they get offended. But I, I my, no. I would go to a movie first. (laughs) I would walk backwards for a mile first. And so she never followed up and said, well, why would you say that? She just was so shocked. This revolutionary Negro who seemed like he concerned with black folks that won't march. I've never met a Negro that won't march. But she didn't say anything else. So when 40 or 50 people arrived in the room, as I was talking, she raised her hand. I said, how can I help you? She said, I was talking to you earlier, and you said you wouldn't waste one second of your life marching for Trayvon. And I just want to know why would you say something like that? Now... She's throwing me under the bus in front of my people. <laughs> She's like one of two white people there. Everybody else is us. And she said it the way I said it and that way I meant it, and which was cool. Now, naturally, 
there was a slow lynch mob forming in the room. <laughs> and my point is sometimes we have these emotional reactions without understanding things. And sometimes we never ask why. We just had these emotional reactions. So as the lynch mob was forming and people was all reckless, restless and looking at me, I said, listen, the reason why I don't march and I never will is, is because my ancestors did it 60 years ago for the same reason we're doing it today. And it didn't work for them. So why would I do it today unless I'm insane, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results? I said, understand something. But in my own limited lifetime, white people have demonstrated they're not going to change. No matter what we do, they are not going to change as it relates to their relationship with us. So, of course, one of my people said, well, how can you generalize and say white people like that? They, they wouldn't, you know, if, we, if they did that to us, we'd be all upset. And I said, well, my generalization is valid. Let me explain what I mean. I said, when O.J. Simpson was found not guilty, do you remember the outrage? You remember? See, when O.J. Simpson was found not guilty, I learned, oh, okay, this is how they behave when something is unjust to them, when something ain't right. I said, now, when Trayvon Martin caught that bad one, where were all of these white people? They demonstrated to me how they feel when something is unjust. Well, if I don't see that outrage, that means they don't have a problem with it. So I'm very comfortable saying the majority of white folks in this country are comfortable with the relationship as it is. Racially charged, whatever you want to call it. And that's fine with me. I have no problem with that, and I have no problem with white people. But the last thing I'm going to do is think they're going to change. So if, if but what about racism and, and white supremacy? I don't believe in that. I said, if you convince me to believe in racism, then you can also convince me to come to a meeting to fix it. White people ain't getting fixed. <laughs> okay, so, no, no, the, the, I, that's like me going to a meeting to discuss how we're going to stop birds from flying. And if I'm going to keep complaining about their behavior, then that's like me complaining. See these birds, they flying again. <laughs> Does that make any sense? So no, I can't believe in racism unless I believe in birdism. And birdism is when birds keep flying. I mean, that's... That's just my truth, based on my own limited understanding of things. I won't sit in no diversity meeting complaining about what the white people keep doing to us. No, it's all right, I understand. Because based on what's important to me, it's my responsibility to understand how you move so I know how to move. Now, once they've been clear, they've never not been clear, there's been no secret, no conspiracy. Based on how they treat us, we are seen by them, the majority, as uncivilized animals and unconvicted criminals who are beneath their pets. That's just the truth.